We move on now to the questions of the Minister of Education, and I call Mike Nesbitt to ask the first question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question one. Thank the member for the question. Uh, Strictly speaking, the only circumstances in which there is a undertaking of a formal assessment of sustainability of a school is when a development proposal has been published seeking to make a significant change to provision. At the moment, there is no uh, there is no published proposal in relation to St. Field, nor indeed, to the best of my knowledge, a plan for a proposal. And therefore, there isn't. Um, I don't propose to take a formal assessment of this nature. At, at at this particular time. I would say, however, I'm sure like the member himself, when I visited St Field High on a number of occasions, it is, I think, a very successful school, one in terms of um, financially, one which is in surplus and therefore uh, has a level of, of security there, and also in terms of admissions, has been in a situation that while the figures are below what would be the recommended number in total for um, a post-primary school, has been a situation with the numbers of the, particularly those applications have been growing in recent years and always completely filled uh, according to its enrolment and admissions figures um, has been able to fill those, those positions and indeed has, has availed a belief of temporary variations as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister. I'm sure he's aware it's the third highest oversubscribed school in the area after Lagan uh, and St. Field. Up to 88% oversubscribed in recent years, and yet the admission number is a mere 68, and the largest temporary variation in recent years a mere 4. Would he support, either as minister or as a local MNA, uh, the school's desire to move from 350 enrolment to 500, to have a sixth form centre, and importantly, will he work with me to ensure the development plan proposing a mid-down integrated school does no harm to St Field High? Well, I did with a couple of those points in, in, in relation to that. Um, I wasn't expecting a cheering crowd from the, the side there. <laughs> um, can I say in terms of that when looking at any development proposal, uh, there are a range of things, first of all, which are taken into account. Obviously, for instance, regards an integrated school, it will be the statutory duty on the department. But also across the board, we will look at any development proposal as to the impact for children within, within the area. Um, Clearly from the position, obviously in terms of answering, I can only answer in the capacity um, at question time as Minister in that regard, but in, ter and in that capacity, in terms of the changes that the member has mentioned uh, in terms of numbers, that would require a development proposal. Now, the problem with that is, first of all, the instigation of a development proposal will come from the managing authority, which is the education authority. But very specifically as regards to DP, um, as the department, and more specifically the minister, will be the person who will then give the legal determination on any development proposal. Um, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on any potential development proposal because I would potentially therefore be seen to be prejudging any applications. It's a very quick way to end up in court, but I understand the point that the, the member has made. Call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, Minister Saintfield High, obviously, uh, in your constituency, abuts and overlaps in terms of its intake with uh, the southern part of my constituency, South Belfast, and there are real issues around oversubscription across um, post the post-primary sector in, um, in South Belfast. We had a German debate about it here a couple of months ago. Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on what he is doing to increase post-primary provision in, um, in the control sector, but also in uh, the integrated sector uh, and indeed in the maintained sector, because we really are facing a post-primary uh, oversubscription crisis in South Belfast. Specifically, I know he may be stealing uh, Ms. Bradfield's, or Ms. Bradshaw's uh, later on question, at question seven, in terms of, in terms of that. It's a very good way of getting in at an earlier stage. In terms of um, the sufficient places from those transferring, there is obviously the issue that, and I know that uh, there is a proposal in terms of the, particularly the integrated sector, with the development proposal again, as I said, I can't comment directly on that. That's a matter um, for the direct development proposal. I, I am acutely aware, as indicated before, that particularly South Belfast uh, tends to access a certain level of magnet for places uh, from well beyond its boundaries. And as such, I think probably has one of the largest number of, uh, of pupils coming from, from outside that. Can I indicate that in terms of um, post-primary schools, 
what we have had a situation because even if there was a development proposal that was agreed, that would take some degree of time to work its way through the system. So consequently, I think in terms of the short-term position, that is one that is dealt with by way of temporary variations. As such, for, for instance, September um, 2021, uh, in terms of temporary variations at present, uh, there has been additional places that have been approved at Aquinas uh, Diocesan School and Wellington College. Uh, and indeed, also further places have improved, um, well, strictly speaking, Lagan College, uh, and I know it was part of the, the wider debate that was had, strictly speaking, falls geographically within Strangford, obviously strongly draws from the South Belfast area. And therefore, there have been further places approved on that basis as well. Similarly, um, the scenario is that, that um, as we're due to, I think students are due to be notified this Saturday of um, the allocations, if there is then further pressure, because there's been a, a lack of alloc allocations to some pupils, um, that further there is the option of, of uh, further places can be approved. Well, time's up. Required. Thank you, and I call Paula Bradshaw. Mr Speaker, I wasn't going to come in, but just while we're on the subject of South Belfast, my question actually wasn't about post-primary. Um, it was actually... No, 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 you're right. Um, it was actually about primary schools and the pressures then within the um, maintained sector, and I'm speaking specifically about St Bernard's, and you'll know that there are huge pressures there from some families where um, the eldest sibling has got a place, but the second child has none. It's going to cause great difficulties. And I'm just wondering what your department's doing to remedy that. Thank you. Part of the problem there is in terms of uh, the primary school places in South Belfast, again, I know that there has been um, some allocation of um, additional temporary variation places. Uh, part of the problem, particularly in terms of, and the member can bear with me a moment, I know that, for instance, there have been additional places this year allocated both St Bernard's, St Joseph's and Carried Off and, and St Eta's. Um, but part of the problem, I think, in terms of St Bernard's, and we are acutely aware of the situation, and there's an opportunity once um, allocations are, are confirmed up on the, the, the 12th of June. Part of the problem there has been, and it is up to schools to set their own admissions criteria. However, the advice that the department has given for a period of time, and indeed we tried to work with CCMS also in relation to this, is that prioritisation for siblings has not actually been something that's been prioritised within St Bernard's. They put those within uh, both the uh, existing parish and the neighbouring parish as being as the top criteria. So I think a lot of the problem at St Bernard's seems to be derived from the fact, and I can understand the concern of parents whenever they're not seeing a place directly for their, their siblings, uh, on the criteria, the way admissions criteria have been derived at, at St Bernard's. But look, we will continue to, to work um, as regards temporary variations, beyond what has been admitted already to the school, and I think there was a small temporary variation increase, we can give, there is the opportunity in any school for the department to give a temporary variation to increase on that. But as present beyond what was initially allocated and a small temporary variation, there's been no further cases actually been submitted by CCMS or the school on behalf of the school for additional places, and we will look at any situation, but we can only respond to a request from the school. We can't, um, I suppose, try and retrofit from, from above in terms of what, what should be the places. Uh, question four has been withdrawn, and I call John Stewart. Number two, please, Mr Speaker. Yep. Mr Speaker, you had me briefly worried whenever you said question four had been withdrawn. I thought we were heading straight into, into question uh, uh, into question five on that, on that basis. Look, I am committed to delivering equality for all school sectors. I have written to the Executive Office in support of repealing Article 71 of the Fair Employment and Treatment Order 1998. And I know it is something which I think there is a broad support across the Chamber. FETA itself is the legislative responsibility of the Executive Office, and any amendment to that legislation would ultimately be a matter that they have to bring forward for them to address. And while my department is not taking a lead in taking this forward, DA facilities will facilitate and act as a point of contact uh, through to the education sector and work with the TEO on any further consideration that they are giving of the matter. Supplementary, John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. And I appreciate this isn't directly within his remit, but does ultimately affect the department that he has um, powers over. And he'll know that this issue has been in the news, both through um, motions recently, and that the parties opposite blocked the Nostradamus legislative amendment to remove the teacher exemption in 2016. 
His predecessor said in this House that when he was Minister, he had written to TU to get this removed. And the First Minister said last month that she was not blocking it, and by de facto meant the Executive Office was not blocking it. Can you give us your best guess as to what is holding this up and why it's taken so long to overcome? I mean, look, I, I know that um, probably frequently members in this House will think I'm in the process of making guesses, maybe not even giving the um, level of quality of belief that's necessarily a best guess in that, in that regard. Really, for me to try to drill into what is in the minds of other people, I think is very difficult to, to say. All I can indicate that in terms of the FETO issue, and I know where you've come from, I know my own party, I, I know obviously as well the chair of the, uh, the committee, I think, is looking at private members' legislation in relation to this, where we would all stand in, in relation to it. So I can only give an indication that in terms of the First Minister, because it, it lies in TEO, she has stated very publicly that, that she's not uh, the, the FM side of, of, of TEO is not the blockage, I suppose, from that point of view. If there are some forms of concerns or reservations over proposed legislation, and it lies in a department beyond mine, it, it is really probably up to that, up to that department to give their particular views uh, as to why, if, if they see a particular stumbling block, as to what that is. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Education Minister has referenced the public consultation I'm conducting on a proposal for a private member's bill to remove the exception of teachers from the Fair Employment and Treatment Order. Will the Education Minister support this legislation in principle? Yes, in principle and hopefully in practice as well. I obviously haven't seen the finished draft uh, of what the, what the member brings, to, brings forward. So I suppose ultimately there is that degree of limitation. But uh, I'm sure um, that in terms of anything which is looking to repeal um, Article 71, I think that both myself and my colleagues on this side of the House would be supportive of that. Remember Emma Sheeran. Call Emma Sheeran. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far, and I think, as you have outlined and as other, uh, others have outlined, all parties agree that the exemption to the Fair Employment legislation needs to be removed so that teachers can receive the same protections that other workers receive. And I know as an MLA, I would engage with the teachers from schools across Middlestar who are all working hard and have done so across this, this year. Particularly, can you um, outline, if you are aware of any outside uh, Ob objection to this repeal? I'm not, not aware of that. Uh, you know, I'm glad what you've said in terms of it seems to suggest that there is broad unanimity across the, the chamber. Um, from that point of view, I'm not aware of any outside objection, but I suppose because the legislation lies ultimately within the purview of the Executive Office, uh, you know, they may have a greater insight in if, if someone is creating any level of any concern or disagreement, or indeed I know has been mentioned, I think, which may be smoked out by the um, consultation in terms of the, the private members' legislation, may also be that the, uh, the chair of the committee, uh, albeit acting in a, an individual capacity, may get a better insight that if there is any level of concern or opposition to it, uh, what the basis of that is, if there's any rationale in connection with that, or it may simply be a question that, that everybody is in favour of the repeal. Well, Daniel McCross. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the answers to your questions so far. I too want to put on record my uh, appreciation to all our teachers who have worked tremendously hard over the course of the last year uh, and continue to do great work in supporting our young people. Uh, Minister, I am a wee bit confused here because you are saying that you are in support of scrapping it and your department. The First Minister has clearly stated that she is in support of scrapping it. Am I right to suggest that it is the Deputy First Minister that is holding it up because it might require the joint signatories of both to move this forward because it's really becoming a, ga a game of guess who. Can the Minister shed any light on that? Well, uh, you know, we've moved from best guesses to, to guess who, which I think, from memory of, from memory of uh, my youth, I think was a game where you uh, uh, had to establish whether somebody had a beard or whether they uh, were bald, etc. Uh, so, uh, look, I will um, gaze into my crystal ball. I, look, I don't know if there's been discussions in TEO I don't know whether there has been any formal position put by the Deputy First Minister um, in opposition to it. All I can indicate that my party colleague, the First Minister, is in support of it. I would be in support of it. But because ultimately the remit for the legislation lies within a, a, uh, another government department, um, you know, uh, maybe the member is suggesting that if there's a vacancy there, maybe I could uh, unlock that particular uh, issue in that regard. But I suspect that's not necessarily what he's, what he's saying. But look, I, you know, I, I can't really speculate on what is necessarily happening within 
as regards legislation on another government department on that basis. Okay, can we uh, bring the, the member Sunil Bradley on screen, please? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question three. Member for the question, I, I suppose this is going to be involve a few statistics. The Education Authority has, uh, has advised that over the past three years, from uh, 20, September 2018 to the 17th of May 2021, the EA Critical Incident Response Team has been called out uh, on 145 critical incidents. The direct breakdown of that, and obviously particularly during the, uh, the current year, that has obviously been impacted to some extent because the critical uh, team will deal with a range of, of pupils, has been impacted by COVID. But the figures are such that in the year from September 2018 to August uh, 2019, there were 67 critical incidents. Um, in September 2019 to August 2020, there were 51 critical incidents. And from September 2020 to the latest figures we have is the 17th of May 2021, there's been 27 critical incidents. Senior Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for his response. Um, does the Minister anticipate in a post-pandemic world where children who have been isolated, um, the effects of that isolation may only come, come to, um, I suppose, to bear whenever they're back in school and in a normal period of schooling? And does he anticipate that there will be an urgent need to set up um, a, a, a service for counselling for those children and have it ready for the return to school as opposed to trying to respond on an individual basis? Well, uh, we're, to some extent, there's probably two separate issues there. There is already an independent counselling service, and I know I think, it's, uh, I think later in, in terms of question time, uh, in fact, I think it might have been actually the one that, that, that uh, was questioned for, which had been withdrawn. So there is an independent counselling service. There is also... Uh, We've recently received some funding in terms of counselling of a pilot because, uh, for primary schools because counselling the, uh, the ICSS um, currently focuses in purely on, on, on post-primary. That is different from the particular uh, critical incident team, which deals with a particular... It's not about here is a particular issue involving an individual. Uh, it is more um, the impact of a particular critical incident on uh, the children of, of the school. So for a, the most obvious example is if there has been a traumatic death which has taken place, quite often the, the impact will be on um, the classmates of the, the person who's involved or sometimes when it's been a teacher that, is, that has died similarly, that, that can have a grave impact. Uh, and obviously most pertinently, and um, I think unfortunately we've seen in a number of instances where, for instance, it's been a suicide of a, a young person, it is that situation where the... the critical incident team is directly involved. However, um, it is the case that individual counselling is available through the uh, ICSS. Um, and as such, I think uh, the, the member makes I think, a very valid point that there was probably an expectation where there would be resumption um, of, uh, of counselling, that there would be a large spike upon resumption. That hasn't really happened and is able to be coped in within that. But there is no doubt that we may be seeing and that there is a danger, particularly with COVID, of a certain level of, of delayed trauma, that children may be very good on day one, but where they are on day 101 may be in a different situation. And I think we need to be ready for all those situations. And I call Orlea Flynn. I can call you and I thank the, the Minister for um, his answer so far. Um, just to pick up on that last point around the, the, there might be that delayed sort of you know, trauma that, that's impacting on the children and young people. I know that the interim mental health champion did say recently that um, she is fearful of a potential tsunami, you know, in terms of <clears throat> our children and young people's mental health and well-being. And with that in context, I'm just wondering, is the minister confident that that critical incident response team that's in place at present, that there's sufficient resources um, and sort of funding that's in place if we do see you know, um, a surge over the common months or indeed years? Well, I think in, in relation to that, I suppose, at present, I think the, the indications are that we are in a position uh, to be able to cope with, with what is there at present. So, for example, um, in terms of counselling sessions, they've been able to draw down some counselling sessions for the summer and front those, those into May and June, for example. 
And as I said, I think probably the expectation was that there would be a considerable spike when children resumed. It seems to be, at least at this stage, that the overall level of resilience, fortunately enough with children, has been that the level of trauma has been actually a lot less than anticipated. Uh, however, with the new emotional health and wellbeing framework, uh, which is mainly sponsored by my own department, but with the assistance of the Department of Health, there is an opportunity as we move ahead next year towards greater resources that can be put in place in, within that. And I think that if we do find a scenario in which there is a particular level of additional pressure, there's always the opportunity to put in resources and then try to the backfill those, if you like, by way of a bid from a monitoring round so that things can sort of react as, as quickly as possible. Call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer and, uh, and actually reinforcing that the untimely death, perhaps through suicide sometimes, it brings the greatest amount of trauma uh, within a school setting. With that in mind, Minister, what steps or partnerships uh, exist for the authorities' critical incident response team at their disposal? Uh, uh, to mitigate further harm, given that the, the stress can often extend well beyond the gates of the school? Well, if we, we would have, I think, I mentioned earlier on about the um, 145 critical incidents um, at all or whatever. Uh, there's, of the, during the last three years, I think there's been 33 of those have been, not necessarily while well, suicide has been part of that, where it's maybe been sudden deaths or unexplained deaths. Um, as such, um, the EA critical incident team will be the the first point of contact, if there are particular then follow-ups through professional statutory agencies or indeed we know that there is a level of expertise that happens in uh, the voluntary sector, in various charities, I think they can draw down on those to, to help. But they are, if you like, the first point of assessment within that. And I have to say uh, one of the saddest duties that I've often had that it's not been something which has necessarily always been in the highest profile. Um, during periods where um, schools have been in session. We have tried to make some quiet visits where there has been a, a suicide within the school and you can clearly sense the, the difficulty in the atmosphere. Schools have been very good at being able to cope with those, but it is, it is always particularly the loss of a young person. It is particularly hard and pertinent, both for their friends, for the family, because it, in many ways it seems to go against the natural order of things. I think any death is, is terrible, but when somebody who is very elderly, it, it is perhaps always seen as it was their time in life. It's very difficult, I think, for those at school, uh, for those teachers, for the, the family, to be able to cope with a scenario where a child under the age of 18 has, has passed away. Well, Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. And he, he may already really have answered my uh, question there, but obviously teenage suicides are a terrible tragedy within our, within our society. And I wanted to ask the Minister to outline if he knew how many of those critical incident school uh, interventions related to specifically to suicide? I would be aware, as I said, that I think there's been indications over the last three years that there's been 33 critical incident visits where it has been, call it an unexplained or a, uh, a sudden death. And obviously, I think within those, um, probably a large percentage of those would be directly from, from suicides. However, I suppose where there's probably a little bit of a disjoint in terms of the numbers, um, obviously what happens with that, the critical incident team has to be there on the ground, uh, generally speaking, on the day in which that has taken place, or at the very latest, depending upon notification the day after. With uh, suicides, with other unexplained deaths, um, often, even if it is very apparent, to get any sort of official direct recognition would come through the coroner's office. And they will then establish whether it's a suicide, whether it's a death by misadventure, or some other form of um, medical sudden death intervention in that regard. As such, I don't think that those figures are not, they're not the education authority, while they will provide the critical incident team, are not directly informed uh, of the cause of death by the coroner's office. Uh, and so therefore, while I re referred to 33 deaths that, where there's been sudden deaths, many of which have been suicide, there's not a breakdown within those as to how many are suicide, how many are other forms of, of sudden death. I remember Jerry Kelly. Call Jerry Kelly. So my officials have been working uh, with representatives from the Irish medium sector over the last number of years to try and identify a suitable site for the post-primary Irish medium school in North Belfast. Indeed, we met uh, recently in terms of calls to first uh, myself with representatives of his party uh, and also 
the principal uh, of the school via, via Zoom. I've also physically been at, at College of First Year. As part of that, um, as part of that examination, there have been several site searches been carried out. And while detailed consideration has been given to a number of sites, as yet an appropriate site has not been identified. However, I can um, indicate to the member and assure the member that my department will continue to work with the sector and indeed uh, go beyond any scoping that we can do uh, in this regard to establish where uh, a second site should be established. I thank the Minister for his uh, answer of tonight and actually was uh, glad to hear that he is very aware of the upsurge or, or the, the surge in uh, demand for Irish medium um, education and particularly that there is a, an oversubscription in College of First Year, which is the post primary school in, uh, in Belfast. Um, in terms of what he has already said, I suppose to finish that, while while because you have given a commitment that you are searching for uh, a site for uh, uh, an extended uh, campus for College of First Year, it's just the awesome for his commitment that that will uh, continue, that the search will continue, and that and, and that there is a development plan for such a, a campus. Well, from that point of view, I can also indicate that. Uh, to give maybe a little bit more specific details. Obviously, initial examinations, and as obviously the members were, that, that perhaps more so than most areas in North Belfast land is, is relatively scarce in that regard. So my officials have also engaged with the Strategic Investment Board also for them to carry out, I suppose as a, a second string to this, um, a search of, of properties. And the commissioning brief, uh, because uh, I think it's important, particularly if you're looking at post-primary school, which is going to be covering quite a large area, um, that again, we don't necessarily rule out potential sites, and consequently, I think the commissioning brief covers the Greater North Belfast area, also goes into the wider Newton Abbey area, as well as looking at potential sites that may be closer to the city centre. Call Jim Allister. Considering that the minister was elected to this house on a manifesto which contained this pledge, tackling the preferential treatment of Irish medium in school build. Will the Minister write to me, setting out the total spend in capital and resource on Irish medium education since that sector came into existence? Well, from that point of view, look, I'm always happy to either write to the member or indeed also as part of that, because I think since, if we're talking about since that sector came into existence, clearly that, is, that will stretch back over many, many years on that basis, so there would probably be a little bit of work done to establish the exact uh, amount. Uh, where there is um, action being taken in, in terms of, if we take a look, for instance, at the cost of first uh, situation, it is actually to meet particular bits of, of need of where there is demand in terms of the number of, of places on, the, on that basis. Um, so from that point of view, this is not about giving any level of preferential treatment. It's about trying to treat um, all sectors with an equal uh, Position. And in the same way as, for instance, there will be temporary arrangements probably made at cost of first year this September to be able to deal as it's, it's outgrown its, its numbers, in a similar way that, that as we look towards other sectors where there are um, numbers from the point of view of requiring additional temporary accommodation before there can be a, a fuller move, uh, you know, we've always got to make sure that there's somewhere physically for pupils to be able to um, have their education. Well, Robin Newton. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, Minister, in terms of uh, area planning, and you'd made the remarks there that no sector will be given either uh, preferential treatment above any other sector. Would I be right in uh, uh, saying that, indeed, when area planning is carried out, that the Irish medium sector is an integral part of the area plan as it's being developed? rather than being treated separately to the area plan? Absolutely. I think that, that uh, the whole point of area planning is to have all the different sectors around the table at the, the one time. I think there is still some work, which I think part of the problems in terms of area planning was it did have a level of disruption because of COVID. And I still think there is a little bit of further work to be done in terms of trying to find cross-sectoral solutions at times to particular problems. And I think we need... There's still a bit of work of try within sectors to try to break down a little bit of a, a silo mentality on that basis. But I think that work is progressing. And area planning, in terms of all the formal structures, tries to ensure that, that all the key players from the different sectors are around the same table at the same time. 
Uh, that ends the period for a list of questions, and we will now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. And uh, can we now bring uh, the member Senior Bradley on screen, please? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister if he could provide an update on any discussions he has had or any work that his department is undertaking to help remedy the breakdown within the General Teaching Council for Northern Ireland? As the member, uh, I thank the member for the, her question. There, there has been, I think, question marks over the General Teaching Council for some period of time. As a result, um, the department, and I'm aware of obviously the recent developments in terms of resignations from the, the General Teaching Council, as part of that, um, the, uh, the position um, on that was, as a member may be aware, uh, the, I commissioned from the department uh, an independent board of effectiveness review, which will look at the, examine whether the GTC's current composition and structures standing orders, internal procedures continue to provide a robust basis for its operation. Um, that, I think, is due to report within a number of weeks in that regard. And I think that, that what action we need to be taking, rather than simply trying to fill a particular immediate gap, uh, that we actually need to take the, um, uh, the findings of that review. It's, it was commissioned and, indeed, um, has been done, I think, by then a, a private company uh, won that commission from a tendering exercise and is doing it therefore independently. I think it is important that whatever findings emerge from that, that, we ex that there's an expedition of, of what needs to happen in terms of the um, General Teaching Council once those findings emerge. But obviously at, at this stage I can't particularly directly prejudge what the, um, what the answers will be in terms of uh, that effectiveness review. Supplementary, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that. Minister, do you anticipate within that effectiveness review the charge that was brought to the Education Committee that there is a risk to children and young people because the General Teaching Council can vet teachers but not remove them from the register? Will that be within the remit of the review? And do you agree with that assertion that was made at committee? I think there is concerns. There's been concerns over the remit of the, the Council and indeed also its effectiveness for some time. I think it is important that action is taken off the foot of those uh, reviews, but that may also mean that if there is an area which is not 100% covered by the effectiveness review, that should not create a limitation on what action should, should be taken. Uh, you know, I have been concerned over the, um, you know, the level of um, potential barring for instance, of a, of a teacher who has perhaps been convicted of uh, any serious offence, and that could also mean a, create a child safety issue, which is why I think that any actions uh, that ultimately emerge in terms of um, changing the, the dysfunctionality of the General Teaching Council, and there, there are different routes that that can be pursued, is comprehensive in its nature and actually ensures that, that we have solutions which actually fill all of the problems rather than something which is simply a patch-up job given where the GTC is at the moment. I call Steve Egan. I thank the sort of, uh, Minister for his uh, answer so far. I could ask the Minister whether he's had the opportunity to respond to the joint request from the elected representatives in my constituency, reference Strayed Primary School, for a meeting with yourself and the Education Authority. Um, I'm not um, in terms of that now. I, I don't want to sort of... Uh, give sort of an inaccurate answer. I'm not immediately aware of having received in personally um, that, that request in that regard, but I have no problem in terms of uh, meeting with uh, the representatives um, of Strayed, and indeed I think that would be part of I think, is a development proposal in relation to that. I mean, from that perspective, there is a particular period in which I am able to meet in terms of development proposals, uh, and as such, for instance, um, that has been quite often where it has involved either a school or indeed sometimes elected representatives. So to take an example, uh, without prejudice to any decision, I've met with this new party leader as regards Craig Avon Senior High. I'll be meeting actually with people who are rep representatives of, the, uh, of my own party um, on that issue um, later on this week. So uh, I am always happy to receive, and it's, it's fairly routine that I'll receive um, a range of representations as regards that. As, as the member obviously is again aware, because the department, and more specifically the, the minister, is the um, 
is the decision maker within that. Those are an exercise which gives an opportunity uh, for those who are presenting the information for me to be able to hear what's being said, and also a record will be kept of that meeting, uh, which will be formed part of the evidential basis whenever a decision is taken on the development proposal. Supplementary, Steve Egan. I thank the Minister for his uh, reply so far. Obviously, that he will not be aware, because he hasn't had this meeting uh, so far, that there are a degree of what I can only concern some concerns we have about the process that was raised about straight primary school, the timings and commitments that were given previously through the EA to elected representatives in the area that are not being met, and indeed there is considerable concern amongst the community as well as amongst the elected representatives of how this approach has been going forward. And could we ask the minister to look urgently at this situation? Well, look, I, I will view whatever evidence is there. It is within any meeting or indeed submission, because uh, in addition to meetings, obviously, within any development proposal, there is also an opportunity, a window of, of time, uh, and fairly frequently used for people to either should put in letters of support or raise concerns, and that can also be in terms of the process. I, I can give the assurance that all evidence will be looked at before any decision uh, is taken, but clearly in terms of any decision, as the Department and the Minister is, is directly responsible for that, that decision. I can't comment on uh, whether there are, you know, whether there's merit, if you like, in any concerns over, over processes, but that will be looked at. Can we bring Claire Sugden on screen, please? Can I invite Claire to ask her question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in managing the GCSC awarding for the incoming second year of the course, will the Minister explain why he did not follow um, the similar approach as last year, given the same challenges? In terms of the GCSE, I'm, sorry, I'm a little bit, uh, I think, first of all, we are in a slightly different situation. I'm a little bit unclear of the specificity of, of the member's question um, in relation to that. Obviously, in terms of the progress of, of GCSEs, we've had different levels of um, disruption. That has to be taken into account in terms of the position. Uh, it is best if we can reach a point which is, again, sort of in, in line with what's happening in jurisdictions, that we begin to move back to a situation of examinations. And again, as part of that, uh, be it on GCSEs, AS levels or A levels, there is a need to have a level of similar playing field across the whole of the United Kingdom, so that our pupils are not disadvantaged, either that there is some level of perception that they are given um, an unfair advantage in terms of their, their GCSEs, which would then count against them when it comes to either employers or universities, or indeed that we create a higher hurdle. And so consequently, I think the, the work that has gone on um, reflects both where we are in terms of the pandemic at present and also actually tries to ensure that the position in Northern Ireland is one to enable portability and comparability of our examination results with um, other parts of the United Kingdom. Supplementary, Claire Sogden. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker, um, and thank you, Minister. And I do appreciate the, the consistency that's required across the UK in terms of competitiveness. However, a teacher in my constituency has raised an issue where she feels that two years' work will be crammed into one, which she says will put pressure on both pupils and uh, teachers. So how has the Minister consulted with teachers on the ground to understand the, the realistic delivery of these courses? Well, it's not a question. It shouldn't be a question of two years being crammed into one. Uh, we've given a, a situation where, in terms of GCSE, there can be unit emissions in the, the bulk of cases. But you know, we've also got to realise that while this year has not been clearly um, in as robust a situation as would be the case elsewhere, teaching has gone on uh, within that. And in terms of the unit assessments, uh, there is then, because of the omission of units and because of the fact that, um, that schools will be in a position through CCEA, to be able to follow a particular pattern. There's no reason in any course why effectively two years' teaching should be um, truncated into one. And we should also remember, because of the valuable work that our teachers are doing, teaching has gone on throughout uh, the pandemic. It has got, I think, because given probably the initial experiences of roughly a year ago, where I think everybody was, was probably scrambling to try to make sure that, that, uh, that they could fill the gap, because there's actually been, in terms of remote learning, a lot better preparation and indeed acknowledgement from September of this year onwards. I think we have seen a much more consistent pattern of teaching and I think it does very much to the credit uh, of teachers and to staff. So I don't think any pupils should be disadvantaged, particularly compared with uh, those doing GCSEs in a different jurisdiction. I call Callum 
I got can call you. Minister, you will be aware of the ongoing campaign by um, educational welfare officers seeking pay parity with their colleagues in health and social care. These welfare officers provide crucial support for some of the most vulnerable students out there and their families, and their work will be of particular importance as we, move, uh, as we emerge from the pandemic and begin confronting the many issues of emotional health that have emerged. Can I ask the Minister what engagement you have had Minister, with educational welfare officers and their representatives on that pay parity? Directly speaking, I think there are established procedures in which disputes over pay can be, can be dealt with. I am not the direct employer of the educational welfare officers, so it's, it, for me to try to parachute in an industrial dispute uh, where I do not have the power then to produce a particular settlement, I think, would be wrong. It is the case that there is a lot of good work that has been done by educational welfare officers. Uh, it is also the case that a lot of good work is done in a range of, um, uh, of activities. Colin Gillard, supplementary. Gormie, and given your, your, your acknowledgement of the complex issues that education welfare officers are equipped to deal with, Minister, have you given any consideration to investing in more education and welfare officers in the time ahead to help us emerge from the pandemic? Well, look, there will always be an assessment. I mean, look, I, I welcome the commitment of the, the member to lobby the finance minister to provide additional support to the Department of Education, um, and I think it's good that we're all on the same page. Clearly, as regards, I think there is a commitment to try and resolve the, the pay issue. Uh, and as such, uh, from the point of view of the, the, the numbers, um, I think that that will also I think, reflect probably where there needs to be agreement on the basis of the workload that each individual um, education welfare officer is undertaking. And I think that that will uh, show a pathway to what level, if any, of additional uh, workers that are required. I call Paul Given. Primary education settings and what criteria needs to be met. Thank the member for that question. Uh, ultimately, as with any lifting of restrictions, it's overall executive position uh, and indeed what is there from the, the task force situation. While there is some evidence that would indicate that the wearing of face coverings will reduce levels of transmittability, the the member, um, it, I'm sure, will also be aware. It seems to be distraction to the left, uh, distraction to the right, and distraction to the left today. Um, it is the case balanced against that is the fact that, particularly for relatively young children, there is a, a period of time in, in class which goes beyond what I think adult populations such as himself and myself would be, be facing in terms of the requirements. So I think that this is an imposition which should be kept to an absolute minimum. We have put into the task force um, a position from the Department of Education that we want to see this move to an vol entirely voluntary situation that was there from the very start of the position, because no one is denying anybody the right, if they so desire, to wear a mask. But we believe it is time that we uh, move within that. The indications, I think, that have been given from the medical officers, because the situation was lifted in England, that when we reached the point of community transmission, at the point at which uh, it was lifted in England, that they would be supportive of that then occurring with their own. I think we're getting to that, that position. And I think for our young people, the sooner that we can move back to as much normality as possible, I think the better. Supplementary, Paul Given. Thank the Minister for that response. I know the Children's Commissioner shares that view about it's time to do the removal of it. Uh, can we look to the Executive meeting on Thursday for uh, that approval to be given by the Executive so that this requirement can uh, come to an end? It certainly is potentially, and I know it's, it's not always that myself and the Children's Commissioner find ourselves. Indeed, I suspect he may not always be on the same page as the Children's Commissioner either. Uh, but once I don't know if this is a virtuous circle or not, it has been put within the, the task force. Um, the task force itself will bring forward the proposals for Thursday. As yet, uh, as this is Monday, I've not, we will not, as executive members, be uh, notified as, as, as early as that as to what has emerged directly from the, the task force. But I would hope as soon as possible we can reach a situation in which we move to that, that voluntary situation. First time is up. Can members please take your ease for a few moments?